grateful to see everybody tonight. And uh, of course, uh, we've been in a study that you guys voted on doing, uh, the book of Hebrews. Uh, of course, that's a great coffee book in the Bible that everybody knows about. So we are going to be in chapter number three tonight. So um, if you guys have your Bibles, please turn with me to Hebrews chapter three. And um, I'm not going to get through all, all the verses tonight, but we are going to get through the first six. So um, I'm going to have to feel like I'm going to have to get closer to you guys for some reason. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but um, yeah, Hebrews chapter three, and it's amazing to me because David, during that time of just praise and worship, during that time of just singing and worshiping him, what he spoke is chapter three. What he spoke is exactly what we were, what we're going to talk about tonight. So I hope that, man, you will receive it for, for everything that it is and what God has for us. So um, Hebrews chapter three, and I'm just going to start in verse one. Here's what it says. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our our confidence and the hope in which we glory. And somebody said, amen, amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. God bless this word. I thank you that we're here tonight. God, I pray that you would change us and make us look more like your son, Jesus. I pray, God, for all those folks who are not with us, who are traveling and got on vacation this week just getting refreshed. I pray that you would just bless them and let them have safe travels. But God, bless this study tonight. I pray, God, that you would use it to empower us, to equip us, to guide us, and to have your way in each and every one of our lives. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. Let me ask you guys a question. Has anybody ever heard this phrase, um, especially maybe in the last year and a half? I'm just over it. I'm over it. Has anybody heard that phrase, I'm over it? I'm just, oh, anybody hear that phrase, I'm over it? When somebody says, I'm over it, when somebody says, I'm over it, what, what do they mean when they say, I'm over it? Anybody, just go ahead. Anybody at all. What do they mean when they say, I'm over it? What? Done. Finished. I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to now unengage from this situation. I'm just, I'm just over it. I'm, I'm just... I'm just so, so over it. Let me ask you, let me just ask, is anybody over COVID-19? Amen, amen. Is anybody, is anybody over allergy season? I, I know I've got some allergies I've never had before. Is anybody over Indiana winters? Amen, Abs uh, over that kind of stuff. Yeah, I've been patient. I've been, I've been uh, you know, just getting along, but I'm just over it. Now, that's not to say, uh, let me just make a quick distinction here. While, my, while I may be over COVID-19, I am not over caring and loving those people that may have COVID-19. That hasn't changed. I, I love them, and, I, and I'm there for them, of course. And the truth is, on our faith journey, we're all going to face some challenges. We're all going to face some obstacles that we didn't anticipate. And sometimes, even on our faith journey, you might be tempted to say, I'm just over it, man. I am just completely over it. Travis, man, I'm just, I'm just done with it. It's just too hard. There's too much pressure. The pain's too great. I'm just done. Can I just tell y'all, if you find yourself in that spot tonight, you're in good company because that's what Hebrews chapter three is really all about because you got a bunch of people that are just kind of just kind of over it. Just a quick review, and I know Chase has gone through this. Hebrews is written to Jewish people who have converted over to Christianity, and when they decided to follow Jesus, you have to understand that they left a religious system. They left a system that was based on laws and rules, and they said, you know what? We believe that Jesus truly is the Christ, and we believe that salvation comes from no one else other than the grace of Jesus. But what they didn't anticipate when they became Christians was that they were going to be persecuted. 
that they were going to be ostracized. And when I say persecuted, please understand, I'm not talking uh, somebody not saying hi to you at Walmart. That's not what persecution I'm talking about. I'm not talking about somebody not, not being nice to you. Please understand something. There are different levels of persecution. I'm talking about these people, many of them, they face death because of their faith in Jesus. They, they face, many of them did not expect to, be, to lose family members and to, and, and to be ostracized from other family members. They never anticipated that. They said, hey, nobody told me this was going to happen whenever I followed Jesus. They didn't know that they were going to lose their influence. They didn't know they were going to lose their affluence. They didn't know that they were going to lose all of this stuff. And some of them just said, this is too much to bear. Nobody told me this. I'm just so over it. And the truth is, there are times in life when you're a Christ follower, as you guys already know, man, that life is going to be tough. I've had people tell me before that that life was actually pretty good for them until they, until they met Jesus and all of a sudden life became hard. You know what I mean? Life just became difficult. Life, man, why is that? Why did it become hard? It became hard because when you started following Jesus, please understand that you got into this thing called a spiritual battle. And it's spiritual warfare every single day. My question for you is this. Did you not think that, when, that you wouldn't face any resistance when you started following Jesus? Some people think that when they face resistance, that God is not anywhere to be around. That God's, not, 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 that God's just kind of left them all by themselves. But I would submit to you that if you're a follower of Jesus, and if you're not facing some resistance, maybe the reason you're not facing any resistance is because really you're just going the same direction as the enemy's going. In fact, I get worried when I'm not facing some resistance. I get worried when something isn't pressing up against me. I often wonder, am I not doing something right? I often wonder, man, why, is it, why, is, why am I getting hit harder than I am? Can I tell you, my friend, let me tell you something. Facing resistance is not a sign that God has left you. Many times resistance is just a sign that you are right where you need to be. But here's what I want to tell you. You have got to make sure that you are firm in the middle of God's word, and you've got to stand strong. You've got to put your shoulders back, put your feet up on a rock, which is the firm place of Jesus, my friend. And you've got to say, you know what? I may be getting hit over here, but I'm not over it, and I'm definitely not over Jesus. I know he's still growing me. I know he's still changing me. And the same God that saved me and not 1998 is the same God that I'm as on fire about as I've ever been. That's what he does, man. You say, you know what? I tell you what, I know my God's bigger than anything that comes against me. So if you find yourself in a spot where you say, you know what? I'm just, I'm just kind of over it. The music doesn't move me like it once said. Travis, you're preaching, or your, your jokes aren't as funny as they once were. I just don't believe that, though, but I think I just believe it. I'm just not feeling it like I used to feel it. If you find yourself over it, read through chapter number three of Hebrews. Just, just read through it. Because you got a group of believers saying, I'm just over it. And then the writer saying, don't go back to your flesh. Don't go back to the law. Don't go back to that religious system. Because whether you know or not, you have found the real truth. And right now, what you need to do is you need to grow in your relationship with Christ. You need to, you need to grow in him. That's what you need to do. I want to show you three simple words just from these six verses that really stand out to me. And I think sometimes we can make the Bible, I think we can make God's word very complicated. But really, Jesus' message is pretty simple. Can I tell you, when things get complicated, people get very complacent. But his message is not complicated. It's very simple. He, he gives us a simple message. Hey, can I just tell y'all something? Let's not make it complicated. It's a simple message. And I believe that if we'll just open up our ears and open up our hearts, he'll speak to us just like he did to those people over 2,000 years ago. Everybody with me? Say we're with you. I know some of you are thinking, why in the world did you wear that heavy sweatshirt tonight when you preach and sweat like you do anyway? Hebrews chapter 3 Verse 1 starts off by saying, therefore. Now, you guys have heard me say this before, but I'm going to say it again. Whenever you're studying the Bible and you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to ask, what's the therefore, therefore? And of course, the therefore is there because it's referring back to chapters 1 and 2 when the writer is talking about how Christ is superior. And 
And Pastor Chase went over that, uh, how Christ is superior to the angels and Christ is superior to the prophets. The point is this, if, if Jesus is not superior in everything in your life, then you, are, then you are living an inferior life. Let me say that again. If Jesus is not superior to everything in your life, you are living an inferior life. If, if Jesus is just over here as a part of your life and he's not superior in your life, you're living this inferior life. He is to be Lord of all, not just some, but all of your life. And, and that's really the, the gist of it. And he says, therefore, because of all of that, therefore, holy brothers, watch this now, who share in the heavenly calling. The word that sticks out to me is that word share. Is that word share? If you, if you find yourself in a spot where you feel like you're over it, where you feel like you're stuck, maybe it's because you're not sharing your calling. Maybe it's because you're not sharing. Please understand something very, very important. Your calling, your calling is always connected to other people. Your calling is not about you. Your calling, your giftedness, your, what, how God has wired you, it's not about you. It's about other people. It's about what God wants to do through your life. Please hear me. You are meant to share your calling. In fact, if you try to live out your calling on your own, it will not work. The weight of your calling will actually crush you. You cannot do it on your own. We weren't meant to, to live this Christian life on our own. You have to share it. You have to, you have to spread it around. It's like our life is a seed. But how many of you know that a seed left by itself, it really has no power. It, it has no power. But a seed, what does a seed have to be? A seed has to be put into good soil. And a seed has to have, have water. And the seed has to have sunlight. But the seed also has to have a good gardener. Because a good gardener will come by every now and then and pluck out the roots so that seed doesn't lose the life that God has put on the inside of that seed. You and I are the exact same thing. We are a seed. And we have to stay connected to a community of believers. So when we're down in the dumps and we're discouraged, guess what? I can get around you guys and you guys encourage me. And you guys bless me. And hopefully when you come in here and you're kind of discouraged, you're kind of down in depth, guess what? You'll get around other believers and they will encourage you. In fact, if you go on in Hebrews chapter 3, if you go down to, drop down to verse 13, it says this, encourage one another daily. Encourage one another day, every day. As long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Can I ask you a question? How can somebody... How can you encourage somebody that lives in isolation and seclusion? You can't. You, you, you can't. And I think sometimes they just, people, they have these gifts, they have these talents, they have these abilities, but they just kind of don't ever get in the game. They don't ever just, they don't ever use them. They don't ever, they don't, and it just gets left kind of undone. You can't encourage people that aren't there. He goes on in verse 14 and says, we have come to, here's the word again, share in Christ if indeed we hold to our original conviction firmly to the very end. So if you sometimes might say, I'm over it. But if you walk in here, if you say, you know what, man, I'm just, I'm just over it. And if you're connected with other believers, I say, man, I'm just over it. I hope Trey comes up to me and says, dude, you're not over it. I hope he'll like, shine some light into those dark areas of my life. And he'll speak to those areas that really need awaken. And he'll see some things that I'm going through that he can speak life into me. And hopefully if Kenny walks in here and I see he's kind of down the dumps, I will notice that about him. I'll say, Kenny, man, what's going on? And I'm going to be able to help him. I'm going to be able to offer some water to him. I'm going to be able to offer some nourishment to him and say, dude, we have got some things to do. And God's got better plans for you and it's going to get you through. But we're meant to share it with other people. Does that make sense to everybody? Say, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's what he is getting. We are meant to share it. We are not meant to just hold it and hoard it. No, we are, we are meant to, to share it around. He says, you have some holy brothers and sisters who share in this heavenly calling with you. It's like he, he wants to open up your eyes. You're not the only one who's Christian. You're not the only one who has faith. You're not the only one, who's, you're not, you're not the only one going through. I had somebody tell me one time, Brother Travis, I think I'm the only person where I work at, who's a Christian. And maybe some of you guys have experienced that. And it's kind of tough, it's kind of difficult because you get around it and, and God calls us to be the light in those kind of places. But really it's, a, it's kind of a powerful thought because 
Man, you can come to church on Sundays and Wednesday nights, and it really doesn't matter what your week looks like. You can feel like you're all alone, all by yourself. But you know that when you come into the house of God, and you can have the rough, roughest week of your life, you know you're going to find a smiling face. You know you're going to find some encouraging brothers and sisters that are going to bless you. How many of you guys have been blessed? Sometimes whenever you come to church, and you're discouraged, but you leave encouraged just because you've been around some brothers and sisters, and you shared some encouragement with you. Amen. Can we give that a round of applause? Amen. Because we're just called to, to, to share it. And by the way, it's not one of these people in Hebrews that was being persecuted, but they were all being persecuted. If, if you were called a Christ follower, if you were called a follower of the way, you were being persecuted. But it wasn't just one of them, but it was all of them. So they could feel the weight of this. They could share the weight of this together. So I could look at Crystal and I could say, man, if Crystal can get through it, I can get through it too. I can look at Chase and say, man, if Chase can get through it, somehow, some way, it encourages me. It lets me know I can, get, I can get through it too. And really, that's what he's talking about. He's really just talking about the, the, the church. I also love the fact that he calls it a heavenly calling. Please hear me. It's not an earthly calling. It, it's a heavenly calling. Let me put it another, to you, another way. You didn't call yourself here tonight. Maybe somebody picked you up, but it is a heavenly call. When we come, and I don't believe anybody's here by accident. I believe it's a heavenly calling. Maybe somebody come and picked you up, but it was God that put it all together. It was God that made it happen. God's the one that, 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 that made this calling come about. And the good news about a heavenly calling is if God called you to it, please understand something. His grace will always get you through it. Our responsibility is just to share with those around us. And as we share, you have to know what God always finishes what he started I had lunch with somebody. I've been going to our church. He's been going to our church for a long time, almost 10 years. And he was really positive. And he said, man, Travis, man, you know, I love your church. And I said, oh, hold on, dude. First of all, it's not my church. It's our church. It's, it's ultimately God's church. But it's, it's our church, okay? So please don't. See, because if it's just Travis's church, all the pressure is on me. And I can't handle that pressure on my own. First of all, it's God's church. But guess what? It's our church. God has called me to be the pastor of this church, but he's called me to equip you to do the work of ministry. And guess what? That calling isn't just on me. I, I didn't come here to do this by myself. I came so we can all do it together. Amen? We're going to do this together. If we're, we're all in this together. Can I get an amen? It's a... It's a calling. It's a heavenly calling. Not an earthly. It's a, it's a heavenly calling. That's what it's all about. And what I've learned is many times God will call people to do things or to step out in faith. And to, he's equipped them. He's called them. He's, and for one reason or another, they, 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 really, don't, they really don't respond to it. They, they, they really, in fact, they, they don't share the responsibility. They shift the responsibility. They say, well, that's what, that's what Pastor Chase or that's what Pastor Trina's called to do. They, they shift it off to somebody else. Can I tell you what? If, if God called Pastor Chase or Pastor Trina or Pastor Travis to do it, guess what? Then it's on them to do it. But God's called a lot of other people to do it that they think the pastor's all to do, but God's called you to do. You're just as called as I am, friend. We're all called to ministry. We're all, I believe, in the, in the priesthood of all believers. We're all called. We have this heavenly calling. I'm a pastor, but you're a pastor too. Wherever you go, you are a pastor as well, friend. And that's, that's who we are. That's what God calls us to do. But what we'll do sometimes is we'll, or we say, man, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just shift that responsibility. Can I just tell you, if we shift the responsibility that you are called to do off to somebody else that's not called to do it, it won't be as good because you're called to do it. You're called to do it. Or many times it just gets left undone. And think about it even more so. The only way God can really strengthen you, the only way God can really get some power in your legs to move forward is to call you and to challenge you. And guess what? Once he challenges you, he's going to challenge you again. Why? Because that's how you grow. And that's how you get stronger. And that's how you become more effective. And you got a deeper desire to get into the word of God. you got a deeper desire to really know Christ. And really develop this relationship with them. Man, but we are called to share. You can't stay in seclusion. You can't shift responsibility. You have to share it. The second word that catches my eye is this word fix. 
fix. And the truth of the matter, I believe that nobody really quits. Before somebody quits in life, really, they, they quit in their mind first. See, nobody really, I don't think, gets divorced. It's really not that simple. Many times, they quit up here first. See, I'm, most people just don't have affairs. They have affairs up here first. See, the, the battle is in your, in your mind. That, that's where our battle, that's why, that's why I love Romans 12 and 2 because it's such, it's such a powerful verse. There's so much truth. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and his perfect will. That verse is telling us the pack is on your back. You got the power of the Holy Spirit. But it's your responsibility to, to transform your mind and transform your life. And let me tell you something. Transformation doesn't happen just because you spend an hour and a half in church every week. <laughs> that, that's part of it, absolutely, for sure. But the verse says that you'll be transformed. You'll have a changed life by renewing your mind. Can I tell you that that word renewing is the same word really as the word renovation. How many of you guys have ever renovated a house? Does it happen an hour and a half one, once a week? No, it doesn't. It happens because you get in there and you, and you do demo and you, and you break down the walls and you pull out the plaster and you, and you just get dirty and you get filthy and you just haul out the mess and then you bring in the new. He says, that's what you got to do with your mind. That's what you got to do. People say, you know what? It doesn't matter what I think. It's just my imagination. I'm telling you what, that is a lie from the pit of hell. It matters everything what you think. Everything, if you don't think it matters, then you are only lying to yourself. He says, capture your thoughts, capture your mind. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you're giving headspace to the enemy and all you think about is just the troubles of this world, your troubles or these troubles, I'm just telling you, it's, like, it's just like this thing that just continues to fester and fester and fester. And you're just going to cause more trouble in your own life. Right, says you have to share, but you also have to fix your thoughts on what? He says you've got to fix your thoughts. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. You've got to fix your thoughts on Jesus. Now remember, he's writing to a Jewish audience. They're being persecuted. They're under a lot of pressure. Many of them want to go back. Angels and prophets and everything else, and the writer's saying you don't want to do that, because remember, Jesus is greater than the prophets. He's greater than the angels. And then he says something else, and you guys probably picked this up in the text. He says Jesus is superior than Moses. Woo! <laughs> superior than Moses? Man, I tell you what, when he says that Jesus is superior than Moses, that really got their attention, because Moses was the man. Moses was the one that gave him the law, y'all. I mean, that's who Moses was. Moses was somebody that, that they revered. Moses was somebody they looked up to. Moses was somebody that they just absolutely worshiped. But what does the writer say? He says in verse 2, Jesus was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses. And I like this next part. Just as a builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself, for every house is built by someone but God is the builder of everything. The writer wants you to see that Moses was a servant in God's house. But God's the builder of the house. And please understand something. The builder always deserves more honor than the house itself. Let me give you a 2021 20, illustration if I can. Nobody looks at their iPhone and they say, man, what a genius what a genius this thing is. We don't say that. What do we say? We say, man, Steve Jobs is a genius because he created it. Think, man, he is, he is, that's amazing. Just think about what he can do. I mean, he's, that's incredible. The guy that created the iPhone, are you kidding me? I mean, that guy is amazing. And that's what he's trying to get across here. Please don't, please don't miss the, the, the the message because of the miracle. You know, sometimes we'll, we'll just look for the miracle. And God says, no, no, no. The, every miracle that I ever did is only about the message. It's only about me. It's just so he can point everything back to me. He's saying, I'm the one that builds this. And I have a purpose for building it. I have a reason for building it. 
And he says Moses is, the, is a servant in God's house, but Jesus is the builder of the house. See, the Bible's basically, he's basically saying, hey, don't focus your attention on the law. Focus your attention on the one who fulfilled the law. Don't focus your attention just on a few isolated scriptures in the Bible that make you feel good for a moment. Focus on the God of the Bible. Focus on the Savior of your life. Focus on Jesus. Fix your eyes, fix your heart, fix your mind on him. He's the one that died for you. He's the one that rose again for you. He's the one that sets you free. Amen. I'm really sweating. <laughs> fix your thoughts on Jesus. Is that what we do, though? I mean, we're in church. We shake our heads and say, yeah, that's it. I'll go first. I don't always do that. Can I be honest with you? Wednesday night crowd. Sometimes whenever I have issues and trouble, I don't all the time fix my, my thoughts and my mind on Jesus. A lot of times I'll fix them on myself. I just fix, I just fix them on my my pain or my brokenness or my disappointment, I'll fix them on. I'm just, just that stuff. And God's saying, don't do that, Travis. Don't do that because that's, that's what the enemy wants you to do. But I'm telling you what, when you fix your focus on me, when you fix your mind, when you fix your heart on me, it changes everything. It just changes everything. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's so easy. Yeah, absolutely. Not Christian cursing either. I mean, uh, I'm just teasing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, and you know what? Right before this service started, in your mind, if you ever preach a message, it's like, man, worship is so good. But in your mind, you're thinking, you know, you know, fix your mind on Jesus. And my, my headset, this thing right here, it kept falling apart right in my hands. And I'm thinking, don't focus on the headset, just focus on Jesus. Don't focus on the headset. And it's like every time you preach a message, it's like, you're going, you're going to be tested about what you're about ready to say because that's what's going to happen. If something's going to mess up where God's going to remind you, hey, don't, don't worry about that head. Don't worry about the headphone. Just, in fact, I was trying to look for the mic before I even came up here because there's been a lot of times where I had to go get it. But, but, but it is amazing how sometimes, man, we will be, we will, we will, we know, but man, we will just like, we'll forget it. We become so fixated on these other issues. And I think it's just important for us to remember that whatever you become, Kind of, kind of fixated on. That's what you, that's what you'll focus on. Whatever you focus on, is really what you'll follow. Let me say that again. Whatever you become fixated on, that's what you'll eventually just focus on, and that's where your life will go. That's what your life will follow. And that's why he's just so critical. To these, and then really, that's why Paul writes in Philippians, chapter four and verse eight. He says. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true. Think about this. People that say what you think about with your idle time is not important. That, please don't believe that. Your thoughts are critical. Your idle thoughts are critical. How you think about people are critical. Just don't, just don't let them wander. Grab a hold of them. That's why Paul gives us this verse. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right. 
Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Because what you think about is what you will live out. So he says, think about this. So let us fix our thoughts on Jesus. Let's fix our thoughts on him. So if you walked in here tonight, if you're saying, man, I'm over it, here's what I challenge you to do. Start sharing. Just start sharing. Just start sharing with other people. Start encouraging other people. One of the best ways to get out of this rut is to bless somebody else. One of the best ways to, to uh, get out of this, like, this dryness or whatever it might be sometimes. And we've all kind of been there. I think you've been a Christian. I mean, you just get, but man, one of the best ways to get out of it is to get your mind off of yourself and get your mind on somebody else and blessing them. Just, just share it. I'd say, fix your thoughts on Jesus. And lastly, look at verse five and six. He says, Moses was a servant in God's house. Everybody say, in. Yeah. That jumps out at me, that word in. Bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over. Everybody say, over. Over. Over God's house. That word over also stands out to me. And then it finishes up and says, we are his house. If indeed we hold firmly to the confidence and the hope in which we glory. It says Moses is a servant in God's house, but Jesus is a son over God's house. The third word that I want to give you tonight, you have to share, you have to fix. But finally, I believe he's saying you have to stay. <laughs> you, you need to, you just need to stay. You, let me say it like this. You have to be much more committed to staying than leaving. Because here's the truth of the matter, if you think about it. It seems like leaving's always more appealing. Leaving's always more, always more, you know, attractive or whatever. But really to get whatever you want out of life and what God wants to do in your life, it only happens through staying. <laughs> it only happens through, through, through sharing. It only happens through letting God transform your heart and transform your mind. The Bible is so clear. The Bible talks about Moses. And I love Moses. Moses is all, hey, pray, praise God for Moses. Hey, man, I want to meet Moses. I want to be his buddy up in heaven. Absolutely. But let me tell you something. Moses was a man just like you and me. He was, a, he was, he was absolutely my friend. Please understand. But here's what, what the Bible says. Moses stayed in God's house. And we talk about Moses because he was used by God because he stayed in God's house. But please understand, it's God who is over the house. I wrote it down like this. If you stay... If, if you stay in it, then you won't be over it. If you stay in it, then you won't get over it. If you stay in it, but if you get out of it, guess what? You'll be over it. If you stay in it, you won't be, be over it. And this is all he's, I believe he's talking about the church when you dare to share. You're calling your faith when you're fixated on Jesus. Guess what? Here's what I believe. When you share, when you let God transform your heart, you won't get over it. You, you won't get over it. When we come together and worship, we're just not saying that Jesus is our Savior, but we're also saying Jesus is our Lord. We are under his lordship. He is the head. And we're the body. Can I tell you, if you get disconnected from the head, let me just tell you all something. You're going to flop around like a snake with a, his head cut off. It's just going to go everywhere. If you guys ever seen that, I mean to be gruesome with that illustration, but it's true. You just kind of just go everywhere. So, man, he says we are called to share, we are called to, to be fixated, and the truth is the only way to have power is to stay connected to him. When I committed my life to Jesus, I asked him to save me, but you got to remember something. I was raised in church, so I, it's like a lot of you all, you guys have been raised in church, you've heard it before, but when I, but when I really committed my life to Christ, I asked him to, to save me, but not only save me, I said, God, transform me. Trans transform me, God. Change me from the inside out. But guess what? It just didn't happen. He put a desire in my heart, but I went with his desire. And I, and I picked up that Bible. And I didn't even like to study you all. And I could not put it down. Because when you get into the word and you study the word, you want more of the word. When you pray, you want to pray. You want to connect. That's what happens. So he's just not my Savior, but he's my, he's my Lord, man. So, man, if, you're, if you find yourself stale, if you find yourself dry, share, share. Fix your eyes, man. Am I being transformed 
Am I continually being transformed by the renewing of my mind? Am I sharing? Am I staying? Am I staying faithful in God's house? Am I staying faithful to my calling? Am I staying faithful to what God's called me to do? I'm going to ask for you just to stand. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for Hebrews chapter 3. I thank you, God, for the faithfulness of these believers. God, because we can read about them and we can hopefully be encouraged by them. God, I pray that we'll be a people, God, that whenever life kind of gets us down, whenever trouble gets us down, whenever our issues and circumstances get us down, God, we'll be a people that share you, talk about you, we'll become fixated on you. God, we'll just stay close to you. We'll stay close to believers. We'll stay in a community of believers. God, we'll stay in it so we don't ever get over it. Thank you, Lord, for this church. I know this is Wednesday night. I don't know who invited you here. Maybe you just came here because you come here every Wednesday night. But maybe you walked in here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've never really repented of your sins. You know about him, but you don't know him. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. I want to give you that opportunity tonight just to... Just say, you know what, I need Jesus. I need to be saved. I need to be transformed. That's you. I just want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Right where you're sitting at. Maybe you're watching at home and you've never done that. I want to give you an opportunity to just make Jesus the Lord of your life. Jesus says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says that he is, that he, was, that he lived, that he was buried, that he rose again, if you'll call upon him, the Bible says that you can be saved, man. Your life can be transformed. Your life can be changed. So I just invite you just to call upon him right now. Just repeat this after me if that's you. Dear Lord, forgive me my sins. I repent of my sins. I ask you right here right now to save me and transform me. Come into my life, Lord, and make it real. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. With every head bowed, everybody closed. I wonder, anybody say that prayer? Just me and you, nobody looking around. Anybody say that prayer at all? I just want to pray for you. Maybe you're here tonight and you just got a specific thing you want to pray about. Maybe God spoke to you. I'm just going to open up the altar. And Chase and I will both be up here. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you want to pray by yourself, but however God leads you. Maybe you just want to pray at your table. I think that, that's awesome too. I do think there's something significant about this. Just praying at the altar. Just kneeling down. I think there's something really awesome about that. Something just weighing you down and weighing you out. God says, man, just bring it to me. Just bring it to me. So, Father, we just commit this time to you. We thank you, God, for your word. Pray, God, we'll just be responsive to you. God, we'll be transformed by you, God. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.